at the end of a long and very productive day um, to talk about what in some ways is perhaps the most urgent and explosive um, subject that we're talking about yet at this conference. I find it amusing to talk about the end, the potential end of due process when in some ways we haven't begun to explore the possibilities of due process uh, institutionally in this country, uh, which is why I'm very pleased to be in conversation with, uh, with four extremely accomplished and thoughtful feminists. Nivedita Menon and Aisha Kidwai, academics um, and feminists are not able to be with us, unfortunately, because I quote, uh, they're in the midst of a huge crisis for their university. They're very much in the thick of things uh, underway at JNU at the moment. They were also instrumental in uh, the debate over due process that was occasioned after a young feminist named Raya Sarkar put out a list of um, the names of men anonymously accused of sexual harassment in Indian academia came out. Uh, we're sorry not to have their views and their counter arguments uh, in, in this debate. But needless to say, many people who are familiar with, with this subject know how influential their points of view have been and also how polarizing they've been. And I hope we'll be able to cover some of that in this discussion. Um, I'm also sorry that Asha Kotal, who is, uh, who, is, who is a leader of the national campaign for Dalit human rights, isn't able to be here uh, ca because caste is one of the vectors um, on which due process has most consistently failed women. Um, but, ho but we have people over here who have plenty of experience with uh, institutional processes and we hope that they'll be able to bring their wisdom and their insight into the discussion, even if we miss Asha's particular insight. Um, although in many ways this subject blew up because of Raya Sarkar's list, I want to talk about another story uh, which is indicative of the way in which judicial processes and law and order interact with the slightly scary but incredibly exciting anarchy of uh, social media and online spaces today. And that story is Varnika's. I know everyone's familiar with it, but very quickly, uh, in early August last year, Varnika was su subject to a pretty horrific uh, car chase on the streets of Chandigarh. Um, and uh, the guys who, who were involved in this harassment uh, turned out to be pretty influential. Um, the story of, of, of how Varnika is seeking justice is an ongoing one. Uh, needless to say, if you've heard of this, you probably did because you know that the story as she told it um, blew up on Facebook uh, and on other kinds of social media. Um, Varnika, I know you're in the middle of, of things right now. But this was definitely a case in which a kind of extrajudicial energy really influenced the turn that this case took. Firstly, I'm so glad you're here with us and I'm so glad you're safe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but can we talk about that? Shall we start by talking about, uh, ab about this, you know, the kind of the strange effect that social media had, luckily for you, on this case? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think in my case, at least, social media and the legal system and the police, they all sort of work together, possibly despite not wanting to. But um, they did in the sense that there were so many things that I literally saw happening in my case that I am pretty certain might not have happened if uh, social media and the media in general hadn't picked it up. Uh, for instance, the first, case, the first instance that I remember is, uh, I mean, I don't know what went on behind the scenes with the police, but what I do know is that they put the attempt to kidnap section on those guys, then it was removed. And then there was this big hue and cry on social media and on the channels and everywhere. And they were basically pressurized, I feel, into sort of doing what they were supposed to have done initially in the first place and put it back in there again. That was the first one. And uh, then the second, I think the biggest instance was that those guys spent over five months in jail. And 
I think any lawyer, uh, at least all the lawyers I spoke to, anyone who has any knowledge of the judicial system, told me that uh, the moment the case starts, the moment the trial starts in court, those guys will get bail within days, if not weeks. And uh, that did not happen. They had to apply and reapply and reapply. And despite how influential they were, despite his father, that guy's father being who he was, it took them so long to actually get bail that uh, I feel like if the media hadn't been with me, if I hadn't had the support that I got all over all forms of social media, all over the news channels, this case might have actually gone very differently. If it hadn't been in the public eye, it's possible the case might not even have gone to court at all. Because, uh, I mean, I don't know what could have happened because luckily I am in this place now where it actually went the right way and went the way it was supposed to. But uh, the funny thing is what you're describing to me is, uh, is in clearly in some ways justice, you know, kind of the, the, the legal system doing what it's supposed to do. And yet the way you describe it, which, uh, you know, is in some ways tells you something about the malleability of due process. I mean, certainly, as someone who, who believes you and supports you, uh, someone might say, yeah, these guys, you know, I mean, five months is too little for them to spend in jail. The other perspective is that, strictly speaking, if the law worked perfectly, the bail procedures would work perfectly. So if they needed to get out, they would get out. But then the trial would also proceed quickly and that you would have as little trauma as possible in, uh, in, you know, in, in, uh, in talking about your side of things and that there would be a speedy resolution to things. So it's interesting how these things work. The thing I find incredibly scary also uh, is that it could so easily have gone the other way had you been a different person, had, had the story not picked up the way it had, um, you know, had something happened and some flip switched, some switch flipped, uh, and, uh, and everyone decided that they were on, on these guys' side. Um, Swati, I know that this is something that you think about a lot, uh, in, you know, in your institutional position with uh, the Delhi Commission for Women. I also know that this is a case that you guys have tracked closely and in which you've offered Varnika your support. Um, what's, what's your view on, on, this, on, this, on this whole you know, legal trial kind of being complemented by a trial by media on, on the sidelines? Firstly, I would like to congratulate Varnika Kundu for speaking out and for really uh, taking them to task. I think I totally agree with her that uh, the case would have gone very differently if the media would not have supported her, if it was not in the public eye. We are seeing Varnika Kundus every day. It is not just one Varnika Kundu that we are talking about. Every day, there are hundreds of molestation cases in Delhi, hundreds of cases where girls are being kidnapped, where girls are being attempted. There are attempts to kidnap. There are rapes that are happening. An eight-month-old baby was raped in the capital. And these are cases after cases after cases. Hardly some cases reach the media, and only in those cases is some kind of a process being followed. Rest of the cases, I think it's all God's, uh, I don't know who is governing these cases, we can't even blame God for it. When we talk about the due process, obviously due process should be followed, but is the due process this, that for an eight-month-old baby's rape, now she will have to spend the rest 15 years of her life trying to struggle for justice? Is that the due process? Of course that is not the due process. Why is it that we cannot create systems in which such trials happen within six months? It is going to be a relief to both the men as well as the women. Why can't we create systems like this? In Pakistan, recently, Zainab was raped, brutally raped and murdered. The entire Pakistan came down on streets and within one month, after the due process, after forensics, after proper evidence gathering, was that man given the death sentence. Why can't we have similar deterrence within the country? I really cannot understand. So there are problems within our systems which need to be streamlined so that we have proper due process. Presently, even in Nirbhaya's case, it's been five years she has not got justice. And this is the way we are treating our uh, survivors
workers who firstly it is so difficult for them to come out and speak against violence and then after that we just push them into this entire it's it's a dark arena i think i would like to push put some statistics in front of you according to De delhi police between 2012 to 2014 31446 crimes against women and children were reported in the capital and less than 150 were convicted is that the due process it is not the due process why such less convictions because the systems are not there firstly we need better and stronger laws but that's only one little little minuscule bit of it because already the laws that are existing many of them are quite strong what is it we need Delhi police is lacking 66000 police personnel for the past 10 years if you do not provide police the additional force that they require they are only able to look after the vips of delhi vips of the country they are not being able to look after the actual women and the girls who need their support and even the other the men who need their support so we need police resources we need police accountability for the past 10 years the center is trying to create a software to digitize the functioning of the entire police force across the country 10 years no software till date obviously there is no accountability our volunteer dcw's volunteer when we busted the illegal uh, trade of liquor and drugs in delhi my volunteer she was paraded naked for one and a half kilometers within the capital and uh, i was threatened that the next person to be paraded naked would be me so that is the situation where is the police accountability the women know that there is a illegal trade that is going on delhi commission for women knows but the police never seems to know so we need to set up police accountability police resources need to be enhanced police accountability needs to be strengthened. and then and we, we need fast track courts presently the so called due process which i don't agree is the due process it needs to be shortened and it needs to be streamlined through the present due process what is happening is that once some men are raping these girls and then the entire system is raping these girls as the delhi commission for women chief with great responsibility i'm saying it because i'm seeing these girls being raped again and again by different stakeholders and that is what needs to be Uh, i think improved if we can proper if we can institutionalize changes if we can make proper reforms enhance our systems make the due process the due process right now the due process is not the due process right now the only support that a victim and a survivor has is through the media is through people like us who are raising a voice if you don't raise these voices there is nothing that is done and i'm telling you it's really shameful an 8 month old baby was brutally raped in the capital there was no noise no noise from the system no noise from the people and i think till the time these noises are not loud enough no change will happen i'm interested that you say that because the picture that you paint is very dark swati but it also seems to suggest that what we need to focus on is reforming this complex of laws and systems that support victims of sexual violence um and that i see that you see uh you know recourse to things like the media or these uh, you know anarchic social media um acts that that survivors take recourse to as a kind of last resort um i'm interested in your view on how the fast track courts have may have improved or or in perhaps in your view not improved the system as it is over the last 5 years um i mean do, is it just that you feel like we have good systems that are not working fast enough our systems are not working fast enough of course look at nirbhaya look at right. varnika kunu right. but you have a no basic complaint with with the system as it is no That's i i don't i'm saying that we must follow the due process and i don't think the social media is anarchic i really don't think so i think it is an expression of what people feel what people believe in and i am not propagating anarchy from any angle but what i'm trying to say is and i i paint a dark picture because i paint it exactly the way it is just because i am the dcw chief i really don't want to come here and give nice statistics and tell you that in one year we'd handled 12000 cases we've heard 3. 
1.16 lakh calls on our 181 helpline, 7,500 visits, 5,500 court cases. We've assisted sexual assault victims in 55 recommendations. These are just statistics, I feel, because the DCW chief had to do a satyagraha for 37 days in order just to be heard. And even now, I'm not being heard. What we are wanting is we want due process, but we want that the due process get strengthened. It is really unfortunate that our systems have become so weak that today we are having to debate that whether the due process or whether the anarchy. No, it's not either way. It's not black or white. What we need is we need the due process, but we need to streamline the due process. Why is it that an eight-month-old baby will next spend the next 15 years of her life trying to prove that she was raped? I think there are problems in that. And the due process is not this. If you look at the POXO Act also, the POXO Act says that within one year, the trial has to complete. Is it completing within one year? It is not. The fast track courts, how many fast track courts were set up after Nirbhaya's gang rape? Six fast track courts were set up. Are they functioning as fast track courts? They are not. So we need more fast track courts. We need those 66,000 police personnel whom nobody is talking about, whom the center is denying to the state of Delhi for the past 10 years. We need a software. We need that CCTV cameras should be put across the police stations. And I think we need better systems. And I, for one, I have been an activist. I have been lati charged number of times recently when I was going to the Prime Minister to deliver five and a half lakh letters that we had collected through our rape roco movement, which demanded strong punishment to child rapists within six months. Even at that time, I was manhandled and I literally broke my arm. So I, I mean, is it that I propagate anarchy? I don't. I use the media. I use the media creatively because if I don't, I put my hand in jail. Two cases are on me. Two FIR are on me when I became a DCW chief. So I mean, so much so aggression and so much vendetta we are working in. Imagine the DCW chief, I am out on bail. What is my fault? The fact that I'm working day in and day out and day and night, the fact that the DCW now is the only commission across the country which is functioning officially on Saturdays and even unofficially on Sundays. And yet the situation is such that two cases have been filed against me. But I'm going through the due process. I'm going to the court. I am getting bails. I am going to high court. I am going through the due process because this is not my fight. This is the fight of Varnika Kundu. This is the fight of Nirbhaya. This is the fight of thousands of girls every day. Recently, a four-year-old girl was very brutally raped in Kolkata. How was she raped? She was pulled by a 45-year-old man inside a bus, and her brother, of her three-year-old brother, kept banging the door of that bus and kept pleading from that man to leave that daughter. Now, the due process, the so-called due process for this girl will be 15 years. That can be reduced to six months, and that is all that we are demanding. Okay. Um that, that's a really good point, and I think we can agree that in many ways, due process fundamentally functions on, uh, you know, on, on our belief in state capacity and in how we can expand it to meet, uh, to meet our requirements. And it's clearly not doing that. But Surji, as a lawyer and as a, as a constitutional scholar, I know that this is something that you've thought about a lot, and it can't be easy, perhaps, to say that women and, and victims and complainants must place their faith in the law because anything else is, is you know, anything else is far too scary. Um, and yet I, I, I know that that's a position you take. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about this? I would have liked to tell first, you t spoke about uh, Nirbhaya, Varnika is here with us. Uh, the criminal law amendments brought in a sea change in terms of how we defined rape how stalking was made an offense, etc. But I stand corrected by facts because, like Swati correctly said, there was a rape of uh, an eight-year-old, an eight-month-old. Uh, very recently, there are countless rapes which we are obviously not uh, narrating uh, on a day-in, day-out basis. It's unfortunate, but it's not like the law has not tried to keep up. It's also a mindset issue, uh, Supriya. You see, laws can change, but if you have people who think they, it's within. Uh, it's their bounden right to, you know, uh, go out and do what they've always done, or they become emboldened in a different, in a certain manner. The, uh, uh, an overnight change in the law or in due process, as we are calling it, is not going to change, you know, the system. Th these things take time to evolve. Mm -hmm. 
But I still feel, you know, with 13 years in the profession, I go to court every day, I don't think I'm still jaded. I sit there, I see work going on. Judges do not, I, I mean, now I see a, a judge possibly getting up, you know, for five minutes other than the uh, one hour lunch break that they have, in which also they are supposed to do certain administrative work. They function sometimes without toilet breaks. Why doesn't people, why don't people see all of that? You, so and again, they shouldn't have work. to do that. So, yes, we shouldn't yeah. have to do that. I totally agree. Yes, fast track courts may not be working as fast as, you know, we expect. They're obviously fewer in number, etc. Mm. Because we are dealing with too many people. There are too many problems. This is not, uh, you know, a, 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 with the kind of country that we are, the kind of issues that we have, the diversity that we have, we, we have our own problems. We yeah. are trying our best to cope with them, and the law is also doing that. I w also want to talk about your view on how the law functions away from these cases that we call high profile that hit the national media or that are appealed and go all the way to the Supreme Court where then, you know, they become judgments that we talk about on page one in the 9 p.m. news. Do you, think we're, do you think that there's something wrong with the way, I mean, courts are also fallible because they're run by humans, right? Um, can you give us some insight into how cases involving violence against women or sexual violence function at the lower courts? Are we doing something wrong there? I mean, is there, is there something that causes people to lose faith at that level? I think, uh, you see, the high-profile cases, of course, get taken up because judges also read newspapers. So, and, and they feel obliged to say something in court the next day. And then, obviously, these are very serious issues, and they also have to keep up with the march of the law. Mm. At the lower court, I don't have personal experience in these kind of cases, honestly, of sexual violence, etc. But I do get a sense from other uh, lawyer colleagues of mine that, uh, you know, it, it's looked at in a very deadpan kind of manner. It's regular routine work for them, you know, Supriya, just like I, I go to court for commercial court, uh, you know, for, um, uh, civil to regular civil courts for regular kind of matters which are day in, day out being, you know, uh, worked upon by lots of lawyers. There are people who are functioning in those courts day in and day out. I wouldn't necessarily say they are, they, uh, you know, they, they become desensitized. But yeah, they have a very clinical way of looking at things. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, I totally understand Ch children of, uh, uh, you know, who have been subject to sexual violence, etc., uh, you know, harassment victims, may get the feeling that, you know, they, they are not being uh, treated as sensitively. However, the law does try its best to pro make a, you know, provision for in-chamber hearing, for, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the victim's names not to be revealed, etc. Right. That, that's the sense that I get. Okay. Yeah. Can so, I, Sirbi, I wanted you to come in at this point. You. Go on. Uh, there's, a few, there's a few things that I'll just kind of collate and sort of bring up uh, based on what everyone has said until now. Um, Swati, I think you mentioned a little while ago that, you know, there, are, there is no one Varnika, there's many Varnikas, but in a way, actually, there is one or two or three Varnikas because as you put it yourself, the... The process that was followed for your case, a big part of it was the eyes that were on it. And that's not something we can say for perhaps 99.9% .9 of the other cases as Swati herself has pointed out. And you know, um, and when we come to speaking of the law and when we come to speaking of due process, it's really, really difficult. I think it is great that we are talking about the fact that due process is lacking. But I want to draw some attention to the fact that, again, all of us have agreed here that this is a slow process. What about what about the time that it takes to reform it? What do we do in that time? And again, what is a due process? What is a due process that actually work? What does it look like to us? Because even at the moment, even as the law envisages due process, you are looking at weeks or months or years of trial. Say even, it is, even if it is a year. Um, there's so many issues with the way this is imagined, the access to it, the wherewithal to be able to file a complaint to get the police to actually take your case seriously to file a complaint. What happens when you have factors, perhaps all the five people sitting on this panel will have the ability to walk into a police station and ask for their complaint to be registered. This is, an, this is a privilege that is afforded to us because of our ability to be able to walk into rooms, to speak in English, to have the backing of educated friends, lawyers, journalists, to be able to do this. But what of the people who don't? When are we going to talk about what to do in the space where something like caste, which we don't discuss in due process enough, 
comes to be the biggest barrier for people, whether it is in universities or whether it is in police stations, to come and even just register a complaint, let alone feel like they can go through the grueling process of living out what it means to be that complainant. Okay, I think the argument that someone who disagreed with you over here would make is that due process is precisely meant for the most marginalized of victims because there is no other social recourse whatsoever, so, so right? Then I suppose that response to that is then, then why have the, those most marginalized people felt that they spoke out and agreed in droves with Raya Sarkar? Why did they feel that? I feel like at this point, I'm not so sure that I can provide an answer, but I want to listen. I'm not so sure that I think we can really say that, okay, you know, marginalized people do not have access. Um, in some of the responses to what happened after Raya's list, a point was repeatedly made by people that, you know, no, there are elections to panels which deal with harassment complaints and therefore that will take care of institutionally who is staffing them. But as we have seen, with we've seen with public cases like with uh, the case at Terry with Pachori, it does not, that has not stopped the panels from becoming, even though by design they are supposed to be strong and effectual, it has not stopped them from becoming weak. The panels have become weak. They do not speak to the people that obviously have gone to Raya with these complaints. And obviously who have come out and said that, look, the kind of process you are talking about, I feel left out of it. I do not see that I have the wherewithal to really reject that feeling. Sushi, do you think that this is in fact true and that the ICCs are in fact kind of a failed instrument at the moment? Uh, I, I will answer that. Uh, Supriya, firstly, you, you did say that, you know, due process is for the marginalized. Can I just clarify, in my understanding and I think in the law's understanding, due process is for everybody. That's right. For, for us as well as... So everybody needs to go through the same process to, to, to get justice. Mm. But uh, to answer your question, I am uh, not sure really about the working of the smaller committees and the smaller organizations, you know, how affected they are by their own internal politics and, you know, whether they are hushing up matters or they are actually following the letter and spirit of uh, POSHA, the act. Uh, but it is a start. I, I have two views on this, frankly, and both are contrary, and uh, I leave it to everybody to decide, uh, you know, how, how they, they would like to see it. You see, we've taken the courts and put them in the workplace. Hmm. So there's a little mini court functioning in the workplace deciding whether one person was guilty of sexual harassment or not. Now, uh, in some way, yes. I mean, it's within the fraternity, it's within the same organization. So I have a better chance of the person understanding the context in which it may have happened. They may know both of us. They may have, I, I might be comfortable talking to people on the committee because, you know, at least some of the senior members, I, I would uh, at least, know them because they are co-employees. Mm. But at the same time, uh, I'm not so sure whether this is a wise idea if you, if you come to think of it, because you give so much power to a little committee sitting there thinking they are practically functioning as judges. Mm. You know, they become moral arbiters of isne sleeveless pehna tha to usne aise bola, fir usne aise kiya. It's quite possible. We, we, we can't... I mean, these uh, are the human fallibilities again. Yes, it's again the human that fallibility which apparently they are trying to reach out uh, and, and, you know, work out by giving training to the ICC members because obviously then the, the expectation is that you get mature enough people on the committee mm. so that, you know, you, you don't have these kind of issues. But uh, there are both things. Both things are happening. And I, I think it's after a little while that we will realize, because right now we are only seeing Mr. Pachori's, uh, we, we, we are seeing uh, Tarun Tejpal, uh, this thing in the media. We are not hearing about the smaller cases and whether, you know, the, uh, the inquiry is, investigation is going on the way as it was intended. Just okay, very, so sorry. Very, sorry. Give, me a, give me a minute. Um, I, want to, I want to stick to this because I do want to, to linger a little bit on the question of Raya Sarkar's list and, and what it did. And my question to all of you, you know, whether you were kind of uh, just following along with the case on social media or whether you were involved in the debates about it, um, is do you think something like this? One day a young feminist puts out a list of names of uh, alleged sexual harassers named by accusers in their academic institutions and all the accusers are anonymous. Creates huge debate. Do you th and, and obviously polarizes people. Does a situation like this hamper our quest for justice? Or is it actually a spur to, or is it something that, that wakes us up to say something's wrong and like we need reform really quickly? Vanika, maybe you saw this 
unfold on your timeline and maybe you know people who are involved in it. What, what do uh, you think? I did. I, I myself had debates with people about who thought that this was not the right thing to do. Mm. But I feel like, uh, I mean, we've all clearly established that due process might work, but you don't know when it'll finally work or how long it'll take. And we have also established that in my case, I got help because the media was involved also because, I mean, let's face it, both families were high profile. The media picked it up. The police had to help. The police had no choice. The legal system had no choice. I mean, at the end of the day, the system might be, uh, you know, might be great, but the people who are working in it are still human. They still have the same mindset that the rest of the country has. And I feel like, Social media is just the easier way. It's, it's not legal. It might not be a binding judgment on the people, but it at least puts it out there. And I feel like, of course, the victims have to be anonymous because when you look at the reality of how our country functions, if they actually give out their names, they might actually end up uh, harmed tomorrow. Because that's how it works. Because a guy, even if one of the names on that list is, you know, whether or not uh, they, are, they have actually committed the crimes they've been accused of, even if one of them decides to avenge himself, then the girl is uh, suddenly in danger. So I feel like it might on some level be... Uh, I don't know, maybe some people might I mean, call it's unnerving. it unnerving. Let's ag we can agree that it's, you know, it's deeply disquieting. Yeah, and uh, maybe if a lot of people, I, I cannot think of a solution, but maybe if a lot of people put their heads together, they can think of a better way than to name and shame people. But I feel like until and unless we actually do something about it. I think sometimes you just need this kind of a push. Sometimes you just need people to be named and you need to bring it to a point where the authorities have to get involved because so far, nobody had done anything about this. And they, it wasn't like one name or two names or three names. It was an entire list. Yeah. And clearly all these people felt like the institutions that they were part of were against them. And so this Excel sheet was like their way and out. And we have also heard of even in the last year, so many examples of the institutions themselves that did not support the women. The, w the woman who was out at 6.30 and was raped in university and she was uh, told that she shouldn't have been out so late at 6.30 p.m. There was the woman in Sonipat who was gang raped and the rapists were acquitted. So I, I feel like in some cases you just have to, maybe this will also give due process uh, a, more, a, bit, yeah, a bit of a push. Yeah. Swati, do you have a view on this? See, I think um, I, I can totally understand their intention. I can understand their fear. I, as uh, the DCW chief, I'm seeing so many cases in universities where exactly is what Varnika is saying is happening. I mean, the universities are telling the girls don't go out after 6 o'clock. The boys can go out till 12 o'clock. You cannot go, after, uh, go out after 6 o'clock. All kinds of extremely misogynistic uh, things are happening. Uh, at the same time, I uh, very strongly feel that whatever we say, it should, uh, uh, it should, I mean, such allegations should not be uh, anonymous. I, I think that if they are anonymous, then at the end of the day, there is no action that can be taken against these people, whoever they are. So I don't doubt their intentions. I totally agree that, uh, I totally feel from the bottom of my heart that Raya Sarkar, what she has done, she has in a way tried to raise an issue which was there, which was very much tangible, but it's just as everybody was very scared of raising those uh, points, because if they would have raised those points through the due process, maybe they would have been threatened. But at the same time, I think that it is extremely crucial that all these girls, whoever they are, whatever they are feeling and whatever they are experiencing, if our girls in universities also don't come out and speak, and if they do not develop that kind of power amongst themselves to be able to come out and speak, I really don't, I think that there's very less hope for the rest of the country. So I would really, really urge all those girls whom Raya Sarkar has spoken to and who have actually suffered something so horrible, they must come out, they must speak. And even if it includes, even if it involves, um, you know, some kind of an intimidation, I think we will have to fight out these struggles because unless we do that, 
Where is it that we are leading as a country? That's one. The other thing I want to respond to is uh, certain things that Suruchi had said. Uh, she basically said that, yes, the judges are working round the clock and the law is trying to work uh, a maximum. And I do agree with you there, frankly. Uh, the judges are working round the clock. And if you go to the police stations, go to any police station in Delhi, each and every police station is functioning is at half its sanctioned strength. And I went to Prashant Vihar police station for a surprise inspection at 2 p.m. in the night. And I was really, really uh, genuinely surprised to see that the SHO was sitting there in, you know, he had these files on his table and he was really immersed in work. There are officers who are working 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, round the clock they are functioning. But uh, we are not questioning their intention. What we are questioning is, we are questioning the role of the government. Why is it that proper institutions are not built? Why is it that proper systems are not provided to them? We are on, a, on one end, on the International Women's Day, we will see all the governments tweet that happy Women's Day, happy this, happy that. But then what is it that the governments are doing to ensure that systems are created? I think that is what is the question. Judges are working, all right. Obviously, judges are working. They're working round the clock. Each and every judge is having to handle so many cases. Similarly, for the police, each and every police officer is have, handling 1,000, 1,000 cases. How is it that you set accountability in a system like that until we increase their resources? So I really don't think, I don't think law is something Law is not, law is not, in, law is like, you know, it's, it has to be organic. It has to be supported. It has to be, there have to be systems that support the law. Law kaam kar raha hai, bahut achhi baat hai. Ek do logon ke liye kaam kar gaya, bahut achhi baat hai. Lekin law sab ke liye tab kaam karega, jab hum unko ek system denge, ek system ke saath support karenge. This is what I want to say. And also, the, somebody mentioned about mindsets. Uh, you know, because people feel like that, people are like that in our country. I'm so tired of listening to this. I, I agree that yes, we have a problem. There are, a, there we have, have a patriarchal society. We have, a, you know, a cultural issues. All of that I agree with. But it's really unfortunate that our leaders have percolated this thought so much that everywhere you go, you are hearing that people are like that, people are like that, people are like that. I just want to understand and I want all of you to think just for a second. If next time a girl like, you know, Avarnika Kundu or Nirbhaya or that eight-month-old baby, if she gets justice within six months, if the perpetrator knows that there will be certainty and swiftness of justice, I think that there will be some deterrence. At least it will not be as bad as now, where a man can actually masturbate in full public view in a DTC bus with everybody standing there and the girl not having any support. I think there will be far more deterrence if we are able to create uh, stringent uh, punishments and methods and mechanisms to be able to deliver that. Uh, okay, I want to come to the question of Punish crime and punishment uh, as one that's separate. But I think the two other points that Swati made are kind of linked. One is about, uh, one is about political support and the fact that ge women and feminist politics have practically no uh, currency in the political sphere at the moment, no matter how much political parties may want to convince us otherwise. Um, and the thing you said before that uh, about you know, the accusers who named names on the list coming together and banding together to fight this out in the open. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I know that there are a million problems with that, but I'm heartened by what I see as a call for a kind of, you know, feminist union uh, of, of young women who can come together and, and, and support each other and, uh, and perhaps fight these fights on their own terms. Um, but to take off from that, one of the things that I want to ask both of you is that socially as feminists, we we're pretty committed to the principle of believing a victim. So if someone we know, come, you know comes to us and tells us that, uh, that they've suffered sexual violence, we believe them. Um, but there are also people who see this as contrary to the, to the principle of natural justice that requires us to, 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 to believe someone innocent until they are proven guilty. How do you reconcile these two things, kind of the social aspect of things and the legal aspect of things, which require you to to do these two contradictory, to hold these two contradictory beliefs in your mind? Um, so, yeah, so I, I'll give a, like a couple of the ways that I look at it and a couple of the ways that um, 
in general, I feel like we should be looking at uh, systems of justice. When we are talking about principles of natural justice, we, I know that this has been ingrained into us to such an extent that we believe natural justice is actually working for everyone. You know, Suruchi, you brought this point up earlier, is that the law is supposed to work for everyone, not just the most marginalized. But actually what happens is the, quite the opposite. The law works for everybody except the marginalized, based on what we can see of the law as it has been working. So in terms of reconciling natural justice with the fact that I decide today as a feminist that I say yes, I believe the survivor complainant victim. The reason for that is simply because I feel like all these principles for centuries that we have seen ingrained in us are coming from a system that clearly isn't working for them. That clearly isn't working for them in the sense that it has been built through what we know as the patriarchy, through what we know is as the caste hegemony, through what we know is a, a racial hegemony. So I'm, what I'm trying to say effectively is that I don't see wanting to believe the victim as contrary to a natural justice because I know that the world is unfair. And I know that what we have to do is take larger steps towards those who are facing the brunt of that versus pretending or saying that no, everybody is equal in the world and therefore, you know, the victim is as equal or as the accused. It, that's, that's kind of how I see it. Okay. Can I just uh, add, uh, you know, I do understand where you're coming from, but uh, f firstly, lawyers keep throwing around natural justice. Uh, natural justice means you hear the other side. So by legal training and by judicial training, uh, frankly, uh, Supriya, if uh, someone were to come to us and say, I am a victim, I would not, and even a judge should not automatically believe them till they hear the other side. You know, and, and the entire process, the due process that we are talking about today is first allowing the, uh, the, the victim to give their version for the other party to defend that version and you know, provide some kind of reasoning as to w whether such an act uh, you know, uh, of victimization took place or didn't take place, how, when, what, etc. So, uh, we are talking about hearing the other side, which if I can briefly touch upon uh, Rhea's list again. Yeah. If we come out with, uh, uh, like Swati said, let, let us not even keep it anonymous. Uh, if, uh, can I also point out that even, even the law says the victim's identity should always be kept secret. That's right. Even the ICC at the workplace will keep, we will keep referring to you probably as the aggrieved woman uh, th that you are called under the act. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the minute your name is out, then you know there are other repercussions to pay. Correct. Uh, by, by putting out this list, what did Rhea do? That one, uh, uh, we were talking about, uh, uh, Swati was talking about that one woman who will probably bear consequences because, uh, you know, the offender uh, got back at her. Mm -hmm. What about the one or two or maybe more tainted men whose lives and reputations have gone because there, there is a possibility that they could have been falsely named mm -hmm. in the list. Can we, can we leave this open? Just, just, uh, just, so that, thank you. just so that due process doesn't take its due time, should we just shortcut everything and put out lists and then tell the law, now you please investigate for all these people? I mean, I think how the reality of how that functions is that, and you know, as, as a lawyer yourself and as a constitutionalist yourself, that's absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm, heart, I'm heartened, you know, as an Indian to see that. Um, uh, I, but I think you, you know that the reality of it is that as, as justified as our concern for the reputation of uh, the accused men are, nine times out of ten, these men are in positions that are so much more powerful than those of their accusers, uh, that the question of reputation or career actually becomes theoretical, right? Because very little actually ends up affecting them. Yeah, okay. um, I, I have some, if sorry. I can, if I, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. can I take Surabhi yeah, sure. first and then we'll come back to you? Uh, thanks, Supriya. Uh, Swati, I'll only take a few seconds. Uh, I just also want to point out that, uh, you know, I do, I'm not going to lie, I do love that idea of hearing the other side out, right? I love that idea, but I again reiterate that I do not see, have not seen and I don't expect to see it in action because I mean thinking of even smaller, because it doesn't work that seamlessly, you know you're talking about other things that intersect with the idea of being able to even speak out. If you're looking at for instance a workplace, how many times, I mean I imagine a scenario in which a woman who is perhaps in a, look at a corporate place, how many times does a woman who is working in say 
duties that are not, for instance, a woman who is bringing tea to a person working in that building every day gets harassed by that person, this person is a boss. A completely hypothetical situation, but how many times can we actually claim that every woman in that building has the same power, has the same access, has the same ability to not just want to speak, but be able to speak. So, you know, the that sort of idea and that sort of uh, balance between hearing somebody out and not, and the worry for someone's reputation. Uh, as Supriya said, actually what has been acted out, we've seen that, I think off the top of my head, I can name maybe two people in the last five years who I feel like have suffered consequences, powerful men for being named. Um, and how many instances can you think of in which they were innocent and suffered and they lost their professional okay. lives? I mean, I can't think of one. Uh, and so I, I, don't, I don't think we should consider this arith arithmetically. No, absolutely. But, but just right. to build on what Surabhi says before we go to Swati, I want to make the point that in some ways, Suruchi, it is this belief in the principle of natural justice and in the belief that when a case gets to court, that it will follow this principle and hear both sides and give it a fair hearing, yeah. that I am actually heartened by this kind of shock to the system that's something that a list gives us. Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all kinds of dangerous and there are all kinds of unforeseen cons consequences to it. But in some ways, if I can feel sympathy and solidarity for the victims who name their accusers in that list, it's because I know that in the end, the process that they're going to have to fall back on is the process that you describe and the one that you believe in. Sorry, Swati, we'll hear from you and then uh, I think we may have five minutes for questions. Do we? Okay, all right. We may not. Go on. <laughs> Sorry for speaking and cutting out the question time. But uh, look, just because I'm a woman, I'm always right. I don't agree with this. Just because the women who are sitting here, they are women, they are always right. They will never, they are, hum devi hai, hum koi galat baat nahi karte, hum kabhi joot nahi bolte. Main uh, isse bilkul nahi baanti ho. I don't agree with this. There are, there is misuse, there is misuse of each and every law. There is no law on this earth which has not been misused. The only problem is that this law, because it protects women and because we are a predominantly patriarchal society, every time if we talk of misuse, we will talk of the misuse of the domestic uh, 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 violence will or the POXO Act or the this act and you know, all the ones related to women, that's one point. At the same time, what is it that we are demanding? We are demanding that please finish the due process within six months. We are of course not against the idea of hearing the opposite side. You will have to hear the opposite side. The judge, if the judge would have believed that yes, the woman is always right, then I guess all the men who have been uh, implicated, they will always be inside the jail. It is not true. You have to hear the other side and that is why we are saying within six months, complete the due process. And if the man has been falsely implicated, if it has happened and it is happening, it is, it's a fact, it is true. There are certain cases which are like that. They are much less in number than the way they have been, uh, you know, blown up out of proportion. But yes, there are, num there are certain cases like that. If the, if the man has been falsely implicated, please finish the case within six months. That man will be exonerated of his charges. Why do you have to make him suffer for nine years the way you are making the uh, uh, survivor suffer for nine years? So that is exactly what we are demanding. Complete the due process within six months and it is something that can be achieved. If it can happen in Pakistan, I fail to believe that India is worse than Pakistan. Of course, we are better and we can achieve this. I mean, why can't we do it? And at the same time, if, suppose it is found, and beyond reasonable doubt, it is proved in the court of law and there can be more systems that can be developed for this. If it is proved that yes, a woman has deliberately, falsely implicated some man for some other reasons, then take action against that woman also. Give a message in the society that this is not something that we accept. At the end of the day, if you falsely implicate a man for something like rape, I agree that you spoil his life, but then you also spoil the lives of so many other Nirbhayas because every time she raises her voice, you know, there are questions that are raised towards her. So I think like, I, I would just like to sum up what I said in two things. One is, please make sure within six months, finish the due process so that the man and the woman, both of them benefit in this process. And the second thing is that we have to ensure that all these 
if there is any false case, if it has been proved beyond any reasonable doubt and proper systems are there, may, maybe more systems and more checks and balances can be put in, but we need to ensure that if a woman has done that, please take action against her too. On that rousing feminist note, I must bring this panel to a close. I'm so sorry we don't have time for questions. Please feel free to engage with uh, the panelists off stage. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Supriya, for moderating this. Thanks. Thank you all for coming in and attending all the talks today. We've had really fruitful discussions and uh, we'll see you next year. This was the bridge talk.